Hello, uh, welcome back to Leopard Street. Uh, welcome back to the cellar for those who are returning and for those joining us for the first time. Yeah, my thanks for everybody for the uh, subscriptions upticks. I am absolutely amazed and delighted by the uh, response so far. Uh, in the last episode, I fitted the point servos to board E of the layout uh, featuring uh, Leopard Junction, wired up the frog control relays for straight ahead running when unpowered, and finished up with some simple testing of trains running on the new track. Uh, this episode, I'll be powering up the servos and the relays, performing a bit more testing. Should be simple, this, right? Yeah, or not. Yeah, firstly, just a little overview of how the board is actually controlled. Uh, I'll be looking at the actual coding if anyone's interested in later episodes. For now, just assume the software mostly works, but needs a little bit of uh, further development. I start with the uh, the power to the board. Uh, here we have a 5 volt and 12 volt DC supply drawn from the uh, layout power supply bus. Uh, to this I add an ESP32 microcontroller, a uh, quite powerful little computer with Wi-Fi support and in this case a small screen integrated in the package which is useful for showing diagnostic and status information. Uh, it saves adding one basically in the circuit. Uh, this board is programmed to connect to the house Wi-Fi network and from there on to an MQTT server uh, which lives upstairs. It's going to use this MQTT server to talk to the uh, wider world, uh, including a computer running JMRI, which I'll use to drive the layout and other status screens. Uh, on a previous layout, I was using the less powerful Arduino microcontrollers, talking to an RS485 serial bus, then via the uh, CMRI interface, which in turn connected to the computer on the JMRI via a USB lead. For Leopard Street, I wanted to move to Wi-Fi, uh, basically to make dismantling the layout easier, significantly reduce the amount of wires and connections needed. And moving on to controlling the relays, I then added a PCA9685 pulse width modulation or PWM control board. Uh, this can control up to 16 servos. I only need two here, so this is more than capable. Uh, these boards are cheaply available from several online retailers, really simplify the task of controlling servos. This communicates with the ESP32 over the Inter Integrated Circuit Bus or I2C Bus or sometimes I2C Bus for short. Uh, essentially reduces the number of wires needed to control the servos down to just two. Uh, this board's also got a control wire called Output Enable, which makes it easy to switch all these servos on or off uh, very quickly. As supplied, this wire is not really required. Uh, the board is configured not to need it. Uh, I've modified the board, however, so that it is required because the default position is now off until this uh, line is used to turn them on. Did this basically so I can avoid any unwanted movement as things start up. Yeah, now the two servos can be connected to the uh, PCA9685 board. Uh, here I'm only using two of the 16 available channels currently. Uh, previous N-Gage layout, I used one of these uh, boards and it was quite capable of driving all 16 point servos. During bench testing here, this controlled these two perfectly well. Now at this point, this is actually all the hardware that's needed to drive the servos. Uh, the board's got a few other elements which will be important later, so I'm now going to run through those just quickly. Next is a TLC5947 board. Uh, this is added to control LEDs. This also uses pulse width modulation outputs, allowing brightness to be controlled. Single board drives up to uh, 24 uh, LED channels, each of which can house multiple LEDs. This board is fed from the 12 volt DC power supply, allowing several uh, white LEDs to be used on each channel. Uh, the board itself is powered from uh, 5 volt logic. It just has the, uh, the 12 volt ready to feed out. The board uses a different software interface. Uh, this is the Serial Peripheral Interface, or SPI. Again, it's got an output enable function, and again, modified so that it's off by default. Yeah, I've then added a couple of test LEDs just to check the control software works. In a later video, I'll be adding lights to the uh, Leopard Junction signal box, and they're gonna be controlled via this board. Uh, for now, there's just a couple of different colors added just to uh, play with it. And next, a PCF8575 input-output expansion board is added. Again, this uses the uh, I2C interface. It provides 16 control lines, which can be used as inputs or outputs, uh, without having to use up 16 pins on the ESP32. They are wonderful little chips. These I've used uh, this and the 8-pin the version of it on quite a few projects. Again, this one has a control line. This one uh, feeds back into the ESP32 as an interrupt when uh, something's changed. So... Instead of having to constantly ask it uh, what the state is, you can just leave it and the little chip will notify you when something's changed, which is extremely useful. Uh, next is one of these little four-channel relay boards, uh, readily available from a lot of online retailers. 
Uh, these provide isolated control of relays. Uh, you can drive anything you want with them. Uh, here this connects to four lines from the uh, PCF8575 and this in turn here will then drive the uh, four frog relays which we fitted in the previous video. Uh, this is as far as the uh, board is actually wired up at the moment, uh, however there are a few more items that will be uh, connected to it shortly. Uh, first of these is the DTC8 uh, connector which monitors the actual track. Uh, this is the, from the uh, Model Electronics Railway Group and as the uh, previous video showed this is wired into the uh, seven blocks of track on um, this section of the board and will detect the trains running on them quite nicely. This will eventually feed back into the uh, the PCF chip when from then back into the ESP and then back to wherever it needs to know it. Now this is the uh, the board as I originally designed it. As I say this was uh, put together on breadboard, uh, bench tested while I uh, played around with the software and worked quite nicely uh, both over USB and over Wi-Fi. So when we install it to the layout it should work perfectly right? <laughs> yeah but that it was that simple. And here we are on the layout with the uh, the breadboard sections connected up. There's a few little test LEDs, the uh, purple board, the blue boards and all the other little bits and pieces are there. Uh, this is all nicely hooked up. So we've got uh, wires going off to the servos under the uh, layout. I'll connect to the board at the back. Sorry about the blurry video here. I will get a better camera at some point. Uh, we have the uh, four wires here. These go down to the uh, relays. Just sort of down there, nicely plugged in. Uh, we have the uh, ESP controller itself there sitting in the middle. And uh, yeah, then we've got the uh, the lighting board on there. The LEDs are on the little board adjacent to it. Uh, this is obviously a little bit of a mess of wires. It won't stay like this. So uh, then comes the uh, the big step, switching it on and seeing what happens. So we come over here, have the, the big power box, flick the switch, turn the mains on, voltage supplies kick in. Uh, we're down here, the lights flash briefly, uh, various LEDs are on the board, and as you can see that little screen is just flashing as it resets itself constantly. Now what's happened here is the points are now hard over into one direction, the little control wire is sticking up, uh, the LEDs are off, and uh, yeah, it's not working until we flick the power, LEDs come on briefly as everything switches off, and that's that. So it doesn't work. So what's the problem? Now, after much playing about and testing, uh, what I discovered was the servos can draw quite a bit of current. Uh, this is causing a slight dip on the 5 volt power supply. Uh, not much, but it's just enough that it resets the ESP32. Um, basically this thing just goes into a never-ending loop at this point. Um, when it powers back up, the servo controller is switched on uh, at startup still. So it just throws the servos hard over, increases the current draw, and round and round we go in a loop. The solution to this is reasonably obvious, and I should have really thought about this in advance, is to add another power supply. So as we've got here is slightly modified. Uh, there is a second 5 volt DC supply. It's actually currently just a little plug-in 2 amp wall wart, uh, but it works. This is providing a 5 volt power supply now. So what this is doing, this is driving the servos directly. Uh, it's also driving the coils on the relays, as these also cause a little bit of a, a volt dip due to the uh, the current draw as they come in. The 5 volt supply I'm using is actually perfectly capable of providing all the power that's needed. It's just a small du duration. It just upsets the ESP32. Much easier, just stick a second power supply in, and then uh, away we go with that. So that was connected up. Uh, everything was switched back on, and now it works. And... Uh, after a little bit of uh, testing and playing around with code, I was ready to drive some trains. Yeah, so after spending a bit of time connecting to the correct uh, Wii Throttle server, uh, here we go with trains just starting moves. So here we are, there's the, uh, the glorious little Hornby Flying Scotsman again, rumbling over the points. This is in the uh, straight through direction, which obviously we uh, we tested last time, so we know that bit works. It uh, never, never hurts to confirm these things. So stop there. Uh, you may just about be able to see the point blades move very shortly as the shadow as I go off to the uh, the desk to change the points. And then come back. And then we start up again in reverse. This time we're going to go into the, uh, the throne direction over the points and over the diamond. And with everything correctly wired up, we should be all right. Uh, incidentally, you can see down in the bottom left the uh, the extra terminal block, which has got the uh, the 5 volts for the, uh, the power terminals in. 
So here we go again, just nice and smooth. This uh, Pico large radius points and the uh, the large crossing, very nice and gradual. Uh, that's about the extent of the uh, the powered up track at the moment. So then we uh, rumble back forwards a little bit faster this time, just because. Well, why not? Uh, we all like playing trains. Uh, going to rumble down. Uh, a little bit of a sky crane is going to kick in to uh, put the train onto the uh, the other track. Yeah, and now then on the inside track, here we come back, uh, rum rumbling up here quite nicely. Again, testing the uh, straight ahead direction, which uh, all works quite nicely. Just slightly touching onto the uh, the other board there, which isn't actually powered up, but it doesn't really matter. There's plenty of pickups on this loco. So then we're going to rumble back, uh, change the points, and go forwards again. Again, this time onto the, uh, the diverging route, which... Uh, goes to show that I've actually got this stuff wired up properly. Um, this is all being controlled via JMRI at the moment for the uh, the points. Uh, the loco just driven over Wii throttle on my uh, phone so I can stand a little bit close while I'm observing what's going on. Uh, the points are working, the feedback sensors are also working. Um, there's no switches on the uh, servos here so the feedback sensor is a, a virtual sensor. Uh, the software is basically implementing two little switches so that it uh, flags up whether it's in either firm direction and uh, JMRI can see the inconsistent state when uh, neither end switch is activated. Uh, this is all done in software so there's no actual hardware involved on that. I uh, sort of figured I'm not actually monitoring where the point blades are at any point so there's very little point monitoring the servo I may as well just go off the software. But there we go so that is the, uh, the point work on uh, Leopard Junction set up. Uh, that now works. Um, fairly obviously this is still very, very much a breadboard solution that needs to uh, to change um, and will change gradually as the, these modules get their own little mountings and uh, stuck down there. The uh, DTC-8 needs to be connected and uh, feed in as well. And um, yeah, I'm going to start looking at some, uh, some future progress. Uh, the next episode on this is going to be laying a little bit more track. I'm going to be moving around uh, back onto boards C, B and A. Uh, to get the tracks laid for the incline. As that goes around, hopefully I'm also going to be powering those boards up. I've got another DTC-8 board to fit for board C, and the rest are just going to be powered up at the moment. The, the boards are pretty much passive. There's all sorts of other little uh, fun and games coming up here. I've got um, ABC braking via the uh, Zemo decoders to look at to protect the approaches into the, uh, the junction. There's a bit more painting. There's some lighting going into the um, signal box. Uh, I've got two other DCC fitted locomotives to bring out and uh, run around and uh, have a little bit of a play with. There's a few more locos that need uh, DCC fitting and there's quite a bit more to do on here. So uh, any suggestions as to what people would actually like to see next or any further details, uh, people interested in the uh, the coding of this and some of the other bits and pieces maybe, uh, topics greatly welcomed. Uh, in the meantime, I will see everybody next time. Thank you very much for watching.